Creatine and hair loss. Let's dive into a recently published randomized controlled trial lasting over 12 weeks that looked at the composition and health of hair follicles in men taking five grams of creatine monohydrate per day or a five gram maltodextrin placebo. I think this is a really interesting study because when you go on the internet and I've seen many of your comments, many people say, well, creatine caused my hair to fall out. Like I don't take creatine because it causes hair loss. And in my opinion, I didn't see the mechanistic evidence to suggest that an ergogenic aid that increases cellular energy, energy production, i.e. creatine, would somehow be related to an exacerbation of hair loss. Now, I know there was a study in rugby players where they were dosed. It was a, a, a loading phase of 20 grams of creatine per day over the course of, I believe it was eight weeks. And in that study, dihydrotestosterone, which is a derivative of testosterone that is well known to damage over time, especially in genetically predisposed individuals to cause male pattern baldness. I think a lot of people extrapolated from that study and said, see, creatine increases testosterone and DHT, so therefore it causes hair loss. And then there was this subjective indication by a lot of people that creatine causes hair loss. But Getting back to this study, I think it's really important that we have really good objective data to now show that 12 weeks of five grams of creatine monohydrate per day does not damage the hair follicle itself. It does affect body composition, strength and exercise performance, cellular hydration, and all the benefits that we've talked about before. But we have pretty good objective evidence to find that creatine does not cause hair loss. The study that we're diving into, as you can see on the screen here, is titled does creatine cause hair loss? A 12-week randomized control trial. This was published in the Journal of International Society in Sports Medicine. In brief, they go on to say that creatine is a widely used ergogenic aid that enhances muscle strength and lean mass. However, concerns have been raised about the potential role in promoting hair loss by increasing dihydrotestosterone. Currently, there is no direct evidence examining the relationship between creatine supplementation and hair follicular health. Therefore, the purpose of this study was to determine the effects of 12 weeks of creatine supplementation on androgen levels and hair follicular health in healthy young males. 45 healthy young resistance trained males between the ages of 18 and 40 were recruited and randomly assigned to either take five grams of creatine monohydrate or five grams of maltodextrin. Participants maintain their habitual diets and training routines. Blood samples were collected at baseline and after 12 weeks, to measure the total testosterone, free testosterone, and dihydrotestosterone, hair follicular health was assessed using the trichogram test, which is an objective way to look at hair follicular health, as well as a photo finder system. And I'm going to share with you the images and the charts momentarily. And that looks at hair density, follicular unit count, and cumulative hair thickness. Statistical analysis were performed using repeated measures of ANOVA, and potential outliers were examined through sensitivity analysis. Now, before we get into the findings, which I think are pretty interesting, I just want to thank you all for being here. Hopefully, you're enjoying the content. If you are, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. Also, today's show is brought to you by our good friends over at nadsunder.com, the makers of certified organic cotton underwear. These are the only boxer briefs and underwear that I wear now. My friends, really important because when you go to Nordstrom Rack, which I was guilty of doing for years, you're getting plastic lined underwear made of polyester. There's all sorts of funky chemicals and dyes that are really not good for your health, especially your hormone health and your fertility. And that's why I only wear exclusively NADS underwear over at nadsunder.com because they make an amazing form-fitted boxer brief that you can wear in the sauna, when you go to the gym, when you exercise. Because think about it, when you're exercising, you're moving your muscles, you're generating body heat. If you have plastic in your underwear or your boxers, you can absorb that through your skin. There's this dermal absorption of both chemicals and endocrine disrupting chemicals and compounds and dyes and all that. You do not want that in your body, especially around your genitals. We've already talked about numerous studies finding that microplastics accumulate in the testicles, in the penis, in the brain, in the carotid arteries. So why would you want to be wearing microplastic laden underwear and boxer briefs? My friends, please go to nadsunder.com and use the code HIH to save. Getting back to the study. Uh, really interesting stuff. Let's first look at the objective ways that hair follicular health was measured. So hair growth and hair loss parameters were evaluated using the trichogram test and the photo finder system that I was mentioning earlier. Here's an image here. This is figure two. So again, this is very objective and they ensured that 
study subjects leading up to the start of the study and then after the course of 12 weeks didn't wash their hair or put in hair products for 48 hours leading up to the test. So it, it was really well controlled because these investigators wanted to objectively look and see like, hey, does creatine actually affect the hair follicle? Because we're hearing so many of these subjective you know, comments and people reporting on social media and so forth. Like, what is going on here? And figure five is looking at hair outcomes using the trickle scale, uh, trichogram results, as well as a photo finder system, not finding any statistical differences between the different groups. Remember, there was a placebo group taking five grams of maltodextrin per day and also a five gram creatine monohydrate group. And there were no differences at the start of the study and after the course of 12 weeks. Now, there are some limitations. I think it's important. Anytime we talk about some studies uh, like this, it's important to understand the limitations. The rugby study that we'll mention momentarily, uh, as I mentioned, there was a loading phase of 20 grams per day, and there was a statistically significant increase in dihydrotestosterone in the rugby players taking 20 grams of creatine per day versus those who were not. This was just five grams per day. So it's plausible that when you take, take supraphysiologic amounts of creatine, that can indirectly affect your hormones. Now, why would that be? Well, my suspicion is that when you're taking supraphysiologic amounts of creatine, number one, there's the placebo effect. You think that creatine is this ergogenic aid. You've heard so much about creatine. So you're like, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to like lift heavier weights. And there's that, that the mindset would, would shift. And you see this honestly with people that take anabolic steroids. Anabolic steroids take about four weeks to build up your blood androgen levels. But after people just start, they're automatic. They're usually stronger. The mind is so powerful. So I think that is part of it. And then there could be possibly... The fact that because we know that creatine increases cellular energy production in energetically demanding tissues, like in the brain, we have the neurons and oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, which is where creatine is largely used in the central nervous system. In the peripheral parts of the body, we have the myocytes or muscle cells. We have the heart cells. And in women, the placenta, actually, in developing a healthy fetus, there's a high demand of for creatine to help with cellular energy production. So... In the periphery, you know, there's that aspect and possibly in the testicles, you know, making you know, testosterone and, and so forth obviously requires cellular energy. Perhaps higher creatine levels could increase testosterone in that way. But I think it's probably more related to the training induced increase in hormones. Now, getting back to figure five, there were no statistically significant changes in numerous objective biomarkers of, of hair follicular health. That's just what I want to mention right here. Now, I know a lot of you who are females are like, look, I can't trust this study. This was a study done in males. And I'm like, here's what I would caution you in, in that line of thinking is men have significantly higher levels of testosterone compared to women. So, and, and much higher levels of dihydrotestosterone compared to women. So if taking creatine didn't significantly increase testosterone and dihydrotestosterone and therefore cause changes in the hair follicle itself in men, it's unlikely to suspect that that would be the inverse would be true for women, just because from a quantitative standpoint, hormonal levels are orders of magnitude different when it comes to androgens in men and women. So I think that's important. But speaking of androgens, let's look at the hormonal levels. I think this is really interesting. This is figure four. What you see here is actually the ratio of dihydrotestosterone to testosterone actually went down. I think that's really interesting in both groups. Now, the question is why. What I think is also interesting here, though, is the, the ratio of dihydrotestosterone to free testosterone went up. That is particularly peculiar. And there was statistically significant differences between the creatine group and the, the maltodextrin group. Uh, it does appear that testosterone increased more significantly in the placebo group compared to the creatine group. Now, what I think is fascinating is, to the best of my knowledge, the study subjects and the researchers were also blinded in this study. So again, it speaks to the placebo effect, and there's no consistent association between creatine versus placebo and hormonal changes. So I think this is just incredibly interesting. But I would like to speak to testosterone and talk about why this is important. So as you know, testosterone is the primary circulating androgen in males, and it can be metabolized to dihydrotestosterone via the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. Furthermore, based upon strong affinity for dihydrotestosterone for androgen receptors, 
DHT has been implicated in the pathogenesis of alopecia. This is referring to male pattern baldness more specifically. DHT can bind to the androgen receptors in susceptible hair follicles and cause them to shrink, leading to hair loss. However, our current results contradict previous findings, showing an increase in conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, as we found no significant differences between conditions for dihydrotestosterone or dihydrotestosterone to the total testosterone ratio. These differences may be related to methodological differences. For example, the current study did not use a loading phase and was longer in duration, 12 weeks versus three weeks. I want to apologize. Earlier in the video, I said that rugby study was eight weeks. It's actually three weeks, so I stand corrected there. In addition, and in support of the lack of differences in androgen levels, we did not find any differences in any hair outcome, hair count, density, hair rate antigen, hair rate telogen, total follicular counts, hair rate terminal, hair rate velus, and cumulative thickness. To our knowledge, this is the first study to directly assess hair follicular quantity and quality following creatine supplementation. Interestingly, we did not find significant main effects of time for testosterone, either an increase or decrease, or free testosterone. Speculatively, these findings may be associated with the time of year, but do not appear to be influenced by creatine supplementation. Now, when they say speculatively, these findings appear to be influenced by the time of year, I think it's well known that throughout the year, there's different phases in your hair, hair follicular growth, oscillating between the antigen phase, telogen, and follicular phase, and so forth. And so uh, it could be that if you did a study in the summer versus the winter, there may be quantitative and qualitative differences in hair follicular changes, but I think we have pretty good evidence now to dispel the widely believed idea that creatine causes hair loss. Now, why do people, I don't want to discount the anecdotal reports of people and make people feel silly or stupid for saying, hey, look, when I take creatine, I lose my hair. Um, I think, you know, everyone is so unique and, and individual. And in some people, that can certainly be the case. Um, but I think as a that might be more of an exception to the rule based upon, again, we have 45 subjects here and there was a pretty good uh, objective way to look at hair follicular health. So I think the other thing to consider here is that if creatine helps you have a better workout, more strength and performance, that is linked with increased testosterone levels and presumably a, a mild increase in dihydrotestosterone. And if you're already predisposed genetically to male pattern baldness, that could exacerbate what a would normally happen anyhow. So I think we need to just look at this through a, a more compassionate lens and realize like, hey, if you're genetically predisposed to male pattern baldness and you start working out harder, you might increase your androgens and that could accelerate what would probably happen naturally. So that's just a personal decision that people should consider. Uh, if you're susceptible to this, there's two things you can do. One of them, you could take a, a ketoconazole shampoo. You can use that. Topical ketoconazole has 5-alpha reductase inhibitory effects that's localized to the scalp itself. And so I've been using ketoconazole shampoo. Ketoconazole is an antifungal. Um, here in the U.S., they sell a 1% solution at the grocery store and drugstores in Canada, they sell a 2%. So I would suggest try to buy it in Canada, bring it home or find it on amazon.ca. But ketoconazole shampoo could be something to do. You could also get a compounded solution of ketoconazole uh, soap and so forth and a 5%, even more concentrated, put that around. Generally, it's like the crown of, of the head and the hairline where people start to lose hair first and, and in the back. Um, and then you could also take oral 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, you know, Propecia and things like that. But those can have, in a small percentage of people that use them, a lot of unintended harms when it comes to sexual health and testosterone. So um, I don't generally recommend those for, for people, but everyone's unique. And so I would highly consider doing your research into that if you decide to take oral 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Okay, so I would like to know what you think in the comment section below, my friends. I appreciate you tuning all the way to the very end of this video. I appreciate your likes, your comments, your shares, and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.